everyone. Happy New Year. I didn't see you last week. Um, great to, uh, to be together again this evening. So, so I'm just checking to see how long my talk is. <laughs> it's not a good start, is it? Everyone's like, what? Um, we've got about 25 minutes. Are you okay with, you, were you okay with about that? We'll see how we go. Excellent. Oh, that's a really good point. Excellent. Look forward to that. That's coming. Just to whet your appetite. Great. So, well, as um, Sai um, and Annabelle already mentioned, we're going to be looking at uh, worship. We're going to be looking at what um, worship is over the next sort of five, six, seven weeks. And I thought it would be good to orientate where we're going with this. So, um, here is our sermon um, series. So, our purpose, our priority, that's this, this evening. His presence, music in worship in all its forms. Um, we're all worship leaders. Did you know that? Creativity in worship. Thank you, River, for exploring that already in the corner over there with, through painting. Jesus-focused encounter and the audience of one. So we're going to be asking all sorts of questions around worship over the next uh, seven weeks. What is worship? Why do we worship? How? Do we worship? Does it have to involve music and words? Um, what do I do if I'm stuck or bored in my worship? Um, how can we use creativity in worship? Is it possible to grow and deepen and develop in our worship? How can we express greater freedom in our worship? Is there a difference between our whole lives as worship? We are called to live as living sacrifices, is there a difference between that and specific corporate gathered celebratory worship? Vicky will be covering that later. Just looking at Vicky going, what? <laughs> I just wanted to say that. I'm not sure she is, but I'm not going to be covering that. But I hope that we'll be thinking a little bit about all those questions that we might have around worship and many others as well. Many others as well. And I'm only going to just scratch the surface of some of those things this evening. So the fact is that worship evokes strong, powerful feelings in all of us. Did you know that wars have been fought over worship? Yeah, Countries have fallen out. Entire nations have lost, um, people have lost their lives and been killed for their opinions around worship. That's not going to happen over the next seven weeks. But everyone has an opinion, strong opinion around worship, especially around style and preference. Not really going to be focusing a huge amount on that. But certainly within the Anglican church, we get quite a lot of tensions around that. When I started um, becoming a vicar, you have to have a, what we call a bishop's advisors panel, which is like a sort of two-day interview kind of panel for becoming a vicar. And one of the things that they do in this, which is quite a, quite a cunning little technique, is they give you a, a sheet and they give you, I think they've changed it now, but they gave you about sort of five minutes to answer about 30 questions. So you couldn't really think about it. You just sort of, do, 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 yeah, yeah, that, 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 that. And then you handed it in and that was supposed to inform the interview. And uh, I, um, I filled it in and thought, well, oh, that's fine. And then I got to one of my three interviews. These are important interviews. I prepared a, for a, um, a long time for them, and I was feeling nervous about them. And the guy that uh, was interviewing me, he, um, he, he said, I'm interested in one of your answers to your, uh, to your um, interview, to your quick fire questionnaire. And I'm like, oh, no, what did I write? Um, and the question was, he said, what aspect of Anglican worship do you most enjoy? And uh, I, um, and he put this, everyone here <laughs> put the Eucharist. But you didn't put that. And I'm like, oh, I can't even remember what I put. Oh, no, I should have put the Eucharist. Obviously, the right answer was the Eucharist as the, the main aspect of worship that I enjoy. And he looked down and he went... I see that you put dancing. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, what was I thinking of my panel? The answer's the Eucharist in the Anglican Communion, and you wrote dancing, and I was really worried that he was going to ask, tell me about your dancing in worship. <laughs> Do you twerk? I, I mean, it's just like, I just couldn't, I was just like, I didn't know what to say. He didn't, thankfully, he didn't ask that. 
<laughs> um, because I don't know what I would have said. It's more breakdancing, actually. Uh, anyway, we all have strong opinions <laughs> around worship, and everyone approaches worship in a very different way, different styles. And it's often our styles are informed by our personalities and the great and rich diversity of the ways in which God has created us means that we express our worship in unique and different ways. You put dancing. Anyway, our f- my first point, worship is our purpose. You know, it says in the West- Westminster Shorter Catechism, it says the chief end of humankind is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The chief end, our fundamental purpose, the reason why we've been placed upon this creation is to worship the living God. It is our chief end to glorify him, worship, and to enjoy him forever. I love that. I love the simplicity of this. Our purpose in life is found in bringing glory to God and knowing the joy of relationship with him. He created us, did you know, he created us as an act of joy. He wants us to know his love and he wants us to love him in response to his love. A bit about that in in a moment. You see, we were created to worship. Now, let's not be reductive about this. Let's not boil or kind of, reduce worship down to just singing choruses, okay? We know, all of us know, worship is expressed in a vast and myriad of different ways that he has given us so that we can express our lives in worship to God. And we're going to be exploring those over the next seven weeks. But it's our purpose. We're hardwired to worship because he's created us to worship. Therefore, we are hardwired to worship. And if we don't worship God, then we are going to worship something else. We may not call it worship, but the fact is that we will be worshipping whether we know it or not. The English word for worship comes from the Anglo-Saxon, which, mean, which is worship. Um, I didn't pronounce that correctly. Which literally means to ascribe worth. To something, ascribe worth to something. Sai talked about that song, Worthy. You are worthy of it all. We're going to sing that in a moment. If something captivates our heart's affections, our mind's attentions, it effectively has our worship because we are ascribing worth to it. I like this quotation from Louis Giglio, um, and there are two parts to it. But the first part is, How do I know what I worship? And he writes this, which I think is quite interesting. It's easy. You simply follow the trail. We all have a little trail in our lives. The trail of your time, your affection, your energy, your money, and your allegiance. At the end of that trail, you'll find a throne. And whatever or whoever is on that throne is what's of highest value to you. On that throne is what you worship. Interesting. What do I worship? What's at the end of my trail? Lord, I hope you are at the end of my trail. He goes on and he says this. He says, worship, this is his definition. Worship is simply about value. The simplest definition I can give is this. Worship is our response to what we value most. That's why worship is um, is that thing we all do. It's what we're all about on any given day. The trail never lies. We may say we value this thing or that thing more than any other, but the volume of our actions speak louder than our words. Yeah? The volume of our actions. Fundamentally, it boils down to what do we do with our actions, and is that expressing what we value? Is it expressing our worship to God? Interesting quotation. So if we don't worship God, what are we going to fill that void with? And we've talked about that endlessly from up here. It's we're going to worship all sorts of other things if it's not God. But St. Augustine said this, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Love that. 
Not until that we, 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 we find God, not until we, we, we ascribe worth and value to him, our hearts are going to be restless until we find him who will satisfy that deep ache and longing and hardwired creation. We've been created for worship, and until we find that, uh, that rightful place for our worship, we'll be restless. So, worship is our purpose. Worship is also, the second point is this, worship is also our priority. You see, if worship is our purpose, finding expression to the whole of our lives, we need to make it a priority. We need to prioritize it. We need to make it central. I'm married, and this morning Sarah said, can I have a cup of coffee? And I went off and I made her a cup of coffee. And then she said, can I have another cup of coffee? And I'm like, hang on here. (laughs) Do I have time for a second cup of coffee? And I felt that slight kind of, oh, I just don't want to do that. And then I thought about this talk and about um, being all in into my relationship with Sarah, which is obviously I am, and that is expressed in my actions and in what I do. And so I trotted off and made a second cup of coffee. What a good husband I am. (laughs) I receive that as a word from the Lord. (laughs) But the fact is, with worship, like making cups of coffee, we have to choose it. We may not always want to do it, but we have to choose it because that is part of our movement towards love. Um, On Friday night, I was teaching my children how to play poker. Um, (laughs) Aha! You weren't expecting that! Um, Actually, they already know how to play poker. We've been playing poker for about five years. Not for money, don't worry or anything, but, you know, the good principles of um, parenting and stuff. And uh, and right at the end of the Friday evening, Zach, I shouldn't say his name, but my middle son, who might be called Zach, uh, he obviously had a really good hand, and he loved this, and he went, and he looked across. We had low lighting, we had the sort of green bays, and, you know, they love all the atmosphere. And he just went... All in. <laughs> and you know, it, all in. And then he just sat back and went, Yeah, what are you going to do about it? And I, I was very proud of him. He had an amazing hand. Um, I, 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 but the point is, I love that phrase in poker, but I love that idea of all in. You know, I, I, as Christians in our worship, we are called, we are called to be all in. What does that look like? In my life, what does it look like in your life to be all in, in your worship? I'm just asking that as a question, but all in. I'm all in. Lord, I'm all in. So, purpose and priority are first two little words, and I want those two words to sort of hold the rest of my um, 15 minutes. Is that okay? Um, And also the next few weeks as we look at worship, purpose and priority Um, And we're going to look this evening at Psalm 95 because it's a wonderful psalm. And I'm going to pick out some elements of what worship looks like because we get it from the psalm. So here, here it is. And this is um, our reading. So Psalm 95. Remember that the psalms, um, am I going to say that now? Yes. Remember that the, the much of our worship songs and our hymns flow out of the poetry and lyricism of the psalms. Anglican worship is saturated in psalm worship because it expresses the imminence of God, which means the closeness of God and the transcendence of God within the psalms. So Psalm 95 is a perfect example of this. Look out for the worship in this. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice. I'd love you to go away and finish the rest of the psalm. I'm just going to focus on those particular verses for the sake of what um, we've we got to get through this evening. 
The Anglican communion um, in the liturgy, this psalm is called the Venite. It's in Latin. Does anyone know what Venite means? Yes, come. It's the invitational, it's the invitational psalm. It is the, it is the psalm of invitation often spoken or sung in the morning. Come, come. So we're going to look at uh, a number of C's this morning. My first C is call, okay? Call. What does worship involve? It always involves a call. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. It is an invitation. The fact is, in biblical theology, the fact is that we respond in worship to what God has already done, to his invitation. Yes, there's lots of examples in the Psalms of express, of we're seeking God and looking for God and God, where are you? But ultimately, across the scope of the Bible, it is a, our response to God's approach to us. We, we see that at the beginning in Genesis, you know, Adam and Eve and walking in the garden and where are you? Where are you? God makes the initial invitation and in the same way right at the end in revelation rather than us going up to heaven the fact is that the, the heavens the heavens and the earth they come uh, we they come to us in a renewed heaven and a, in a renewed earth and across the whole of the biblical landscape we have god seeking and and drawing close to us and our worship is always in response to that call amazing isn't that fantastic? So, I hope that makes sense. And it's not conditional. You know, um, that is, Christian worship, Christian prayer um, is it, it, not conditional. It's not so that we come to God with our worship so that, he can, he, so that we can make him do something. No, it's relational. It is, it is within the relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we come in worship. So that's my first C, is a call, a call um, to worship. The second one is corporate, corporate. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Really important here. Yes, there are lots of Psalms where David talks about himself, his own personal worship life, his own personal struggles and his own personal prayer life. But throughout scripture, the relationship of God with his people is first and foremost expressed corporately. Yeah? That is where it is most perfectly expressed. And our personal worship flows out from our corporate worship. It's that way round, not the other way round. Yeah? Does that make sense? So when we come together on a Sunday to corporately worship, that feeds into our own individual expressions of worship throughout the week in all sorts of different ways. But it starts corporately and then moves out. Hence the together aspect. Hence within the Anglican church, communion is a wonderful expression of worship, not necessarily dancing, communion, the Eucharist. I like this quotation from Paul Tripp. I also like his name. Corporate worship is a regular gracious reminder that it's not about you. Thank you, Paul. You've been born into a life that is a celebration of another. Like that. You've been born into a life that is an, a celebration of another. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. And we are called to graciously come together. And that is a gracious reminder of where we are in that context. And this can, uh, we can sometimes bump up against the individualism of our culture with that, can't we? My quiet time, my worship playlist, my favorite worship leader, my band, my favorite hymn, my favorite music, my, you know, we, we can get sort of fixated, but the fact is that there's an aspect of our sacrifice and surrender as we come corporately before God. Here's another quotation, which you'll also like, by Marianne Mix, who's also got a great name. When we worship together as a community of living Christians, we do not worship alone. We worship with all the company of heaven. 
When two or more are gathered, three or more are gathered, I will be there. But we are gathering not just as the 80 people here, but we are gathering with the whole communion of saints and the heavenly host who are also worshipping. And we worship with them and alongside them. I love that idea. Isn't that a great thought? However our worship is, whatever we bring, however bad it is on you know, the hymns or the poetry or the dancing or whatever it is, the fact is we are participating with the heavenly hosts and the heavenly angels who are permanently and beautifully worshipping. Years ago, someone said to me, um, this was really years ago because this was on a cassette, and they said, you need to listen to this, Tom. And they played it on a cassette, and he said, this is angels singing. And I went, really, is it? Um, but you can actually go onto YouTube, and it's, someone's put it on YouTube, but it's a beautiful example. I don't know whether, you know, not here to, to, uh, uh, to um, it, what am I trying to say? I don't want to doubt this because it's really beautiful. But the fact is, when you play it, someone is saying, we were just worshipping, we were just doing a band practice of about seven or eight people, but this is what we heard when we played it back. And there are these incredible sounds and incredible angelic voices. Thousands of sustained, thousands of angelic voices, a clear swell of angelic voices. Um, an, uh, An audible manifestation of a spiritual reality. Perhaps God reminding us that when we sing, we are singing with the angels. So we've done two, call and corporate. Um, We're nearly there. And my third one is corporal, which Vicky reminded me this week is the means of the body. Corporal. Here's in the psalm. Let us extol him with music and song, verse 2. Come, let us bow down and worship. Oh, more movement here. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. There is a great physicality that's expressed in this psalm and many of the psalms throughout scripture. You know, we think that hands up in worship is a modern phenomenon. (laughs) It, It really isn't. It's an ancient, ancient practice. If you look at ancient pots, you know, when they used to Draw on pots. I don't know what the technical term is, but that was an archaeological um, expression of what happened in history. And there's a lot of Christians that are worshipping like this. It's not just a sort of modern Pentecostal phenomenon. That is an you are practicing an ancient, an ancient form of worship by doing that. I like that. Likewise, banner worshipping as well. More of that in a moment. You know, my earliest memory of worship, I wonder what yours was, but my earliest memory of worship involved incense. I was at a boarding school, and on a Friday evening, the chaplain would make the chapel completely dark with a few tea lights and candles that just flickered, and then he would pump masses of incense into the chapel that you just couldn't see. You wouldn't be able to do it now. It would be a health and safety thing. But you, it was like a pea soup of incense. And once you kind of, uh, 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 and I would, I would sneak in and sit in the corner in the dark. And I didn't really know what, why I was there. Because I hadn't, I wasn't really a Christian as I understand that, but there was something about it that compelled me. And the fact is that there were hundreds of boys, they were all boys' school, hundreds of boys in the chapel, and they all sneaked in. The reason why is no one could see them. And I remember coming out and I saw that captain of rugby was in the chapel, you know, who was quite a sort of cool guy, but he had sneaked in as well because he obviously really enjoyed the anonymity of of that little moment. But, But for me, that was my first experience of worship. It had all the elements, yeah? The, it, it, it had a visceral sense, I had a visceral sense of God's presence enveloping me. The, the incense, there was an otherness, there was a, something very beautiful about that. The light flickering, the, the dimness, the, 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 um, the beauty. We play music and then there was silence and then there was more music and occasional reading poetry. It was a beautiful, divine moment for me, affecting all my senses. 
which was lovely. It's quite funny to me that that's my most meaningful first moment of worship was, was ostensibly quite high church when my tradition is more low church. But I'm quite drawn to cathedral worship now. There's something, kind of, I like the drama of it, like the beauty of it, like the, the kind of um, the, the, the aspects of the ritual and certainly the poetry appeals to me in the way that it didn't 10, 15 years ago. Let's have another quotation. Um, Lamar Boschman, which is the best name. Here we go. Our entire being is fashioned as an instrument of praise. Our entire being. Just as a master violin maker designs an instrument to produce maximum aesthetic results, so God tailor-made our bodies, our souls, and spirits to work together in consonance to produce pleasing expressions of praise and worship. When we use body language to express praise, that which is internal becomes visible. So it becomes an external expression of a visible reality. Love that image of a violin. You know, God is make, like a, making a Stradivarius and wanting to, to pull and draw the most beautiful tune out of it is what he wants for us. Beauty is really important when it comes to worship. What do you find beautiful? Chances are the things that you find beautiful are the things that draw you to worship. And it's worth thinking, where is there beauty in my life? Is it music? Is it dance? Is it poetry? Is it sport? Is it whatever it is that you find beautiful, chances are God will be drawing worship out of you in that. That's my experience. Anyway, I, I wasn't planning to say that, but I just thought I would. My last C, and I'll land with this. My last C. We've had cool, corporate, corporal, and costly. You see, Christian worship often is costly. It often demands something of us that we may not feel like giving. If it's very easy and we just go through the paces and go through the motions, chances are we're perhaps not engaging in the way in which God wants us to engage in worship. Giving our time, giving our money, giving our energy, giving ourselves in worship. And it's costly. I always remember David, you know the story of David dancing before the armies of the living God and he's wearing an ephod, which is effectively... <laughs> sort of baggy pants, and just that. And he, he, he gives his dignity to God in that moment. That is the costly act of worship that he gives, dancing in his pants before all his mates who are in the army. <laughs> it's extraordinary, extraordinary. What does costly worship look like for you and look like for me? What does... Hmm... I'm going to land now. I'm going to land now. But what does costly worship look like for you? I wonder with worship, it may be worth saying this, that for me, um, I, I've learned, God's taught me a lot in worship where I've, I'm happy to move towards the things that I like and express and I like you know, movement and drama and I like dancing and those things are kind of easy for me. But in the last 15 years, God's called me, a, sort of, I felt called into those areas where I felt less comfortable, yeah? And that, in doing that, that's brought greater freedom and a, and a depth of worship for me. And I wonder what that might look like for you. Now, that's not to say that, you know, I, I, you know bo both is safe, um, if, if you find uh, worship through liturgy and structure and order as a perf and a beautiful way of worshiping. Absolutely, I too love that. But I wonder, just as a challenge for all of us, what is it like to move into spontaneity and a little bit more demonstrative worship? In the same way, conversely, if you're all kind of, you know, noise and noise and, you know, I love the guitars and the drums and the... What does it look like to move into a little bit more silence, 
a little bit more contemplative, a little bit more liturgical order and poetry? What does that look like for you? Because maybe God will be wanting to speak to you and deepen your life of worship in that area. That's not to diminish this, which is where you, you swim most happily, but it, it kind of, you know, there's, there are times where we, we need to move to a different stream because he has, he has blessings for us in that other stream. Does that make sense? Okay. That's the sort of last point that I wanted to make. Why doesn't the band come up? Band, you've waited patiently. Thank you. Our worshippers. So what does greater freedom look like for me and for you, for us, in our worship? What does that look like? What are you willing... What... You know... What does demonstrating worship look like? I used to be in a church with the the leader who would ask, and I said this before, he'd ask the question, where's your Pratt level in worship? It's not a very fashionable word, Pratt. But he would ask, where's your Pratt level? Everyone's got a Pratt level, he said, but where's yours? And what I mean by this, particularly in sort of demonstrative, charismatic style worship, you know, this might be your Pratt level. That's where I feel awkward in worship, doing that. Yeah? And he would say, what would it look like to step a little bit over your Pratt line? (laughs) In worship, because it's costly. That is the costly act. What would it look like just to do this? (laughs) No one's looking at us anyway. It doesn't matter. It's all about the heart. So please don't, don't feel that I'm saying you have to be demonstrative. But in our demonstrative style of worship, our demonstrative aesthetic, sometimes it might be worth thinking, yeah, what does that look like? What is, what, what is that? Is that way beyond your Pratt level? <laughs> yeah? Don't know. Is banner waving? That might be like, I'm sorry, but that is way, that's 1980s shine, Jesus shine, I can't possibly do that. But maybe God is calling you to say, I want you to give me that. Really? Yes. Give me that, your fear of others, whatever. Because banner waving is a highly prophetic act. It's, a, it's, it was, it, it's an act of warfare. It's a, it's a sign of God, I'm in your battle, and I am declaring your victory. Hey, let's stand together. Mm-hmm.